Now, there are anti-communist protests taking place right now in Cuba. And interestingly, a lot of socialists here in the United States are really trying to turn a blind eye to it. Now, here to talk with us about why that is and what's really going on with this is Zilvanas Solanas, and he's the president of the Foundation for Economic Education. A real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thank you, Josh. So let, let's get into kind of the big picture first of what's happening in Cuba right now. I know that these are anti-communist protests. Cubans will tell you that. They're very adamant about it. But people are trying to say it's not about that. They're trying to say it's about uh, COVID lockdown policies and things like this. What, what's the truth of the situation? Well, it does appear that the Cuban people have had enough. Uh, I think it, what could have been happening that many opposition groups decided that anything is better than what they're having right now. And that's why they're probably on the streets. Of course, there are many elements and COVID is a catalyst. But I think the, the, the official position of the Cuban government that this is about the blockade or the embargo uh, just doesn't hold water. And the fact that the socialists, well, socialists, they're always inconsistent. But I do, I do find it hypocritical that uh, people condemn police violence here in US, which is condemnable. At the same time, they turn a blind eye to what's happening in Cuba. What is even worse, uh, many, many democratic socialists or people who call themselves democratic socialists, they completely ignore the fact uh, that many Cubans basically say down with socialism or give us freedom. Well, this is an important question then. I mean, you of course lived under the Soviet Union. I mean, is this a common pattern in terms of this double narrative where they can say that they, they oppose police brutality but then they turn a blind eye to it when it supports their own interests. Is, it, is this a common thread you see with people who support these systems? Oh, absolutely. So uh, I was born in 81 and uh, in Lithuania, and Lithuania was uh, forcefully incorporated into Soviet Union. So I lived under socialism. I saw socialism collapse, thank God. And, uh, you know, when you read history books, you, you do see this pattern. Uh, you, you, it, it goes all the way, let's say, to the you know, 1939. Stalin and Hitler created a secret pact which actually enabled uh, World War II. And without getting too much in the details, basically had national socialists and international socialists working together. And uh, many communists in the Western world were kind of taken aback from how, how this could happen. And you can see uh, many times throughout the sort of a history uh, is that there are many Western intellectuals, and many of them very smart people in their field of view, but they completely fail to see through the propaganda and completely failed to condemn socialism. I mean, there's a famous case of Walter Durante, and uh, you, had, you have a famous case uh, when a journalist of New York Times, he exposed, uh, he exposed the Holodomor of a sort of a starvation genocide in, in, in Ukraine, and uh, New York Times Ladies basically more or less covered it up. So we were talking just now about kind of the hypocrisy that takes place, where they, they can turn a blind eye to it when, when it suits their own interests. But I, I think this brings up the bigger question of, I mean, I'd say to what extent do the narratives actually reflect what they believe in? Because is it, is it really about the narrative, like opposing pr police brutality, or do they not actually care about that and it's about something else? That's a very difficult question. You're basically asking to get into someone's mind and realize and kind of understand what exactly is it that, that they're thinking. I would probably, there are three groups of people that are people who honestly believe what they're saying. There are people who will, will, would use anything that anything bad that is happening in the United States to justify uh, socialism. And then there are honestly people who do not know. Once again, uh, the world is a difficult place. Whenever something bad happens, there are multiple uh, sort of uh, factors behind it. And it's, re it's, it's, it's real difficult. I think the best thing that all of us could do and the best thing that you know the media and the social media could do is just provide the facts uh, and let people make up their mind. Uh, unfortunately, I think in many cases uh, we have not just facts, so we have very few facts and we have a lot of, a lot of opinions. Once again, nothing wrong, but you know, opinions should be opinions, facts should be facts, and let's not pass opinions as facts and vice versa. You know, another thing we see oftentimes is that people say that's not real communism. Mm -hmm. They talk about the, the Soviet Union, they talk about Cuba. They say that's not real communism, that's, that's national socialism or, you know, state socialism or state capitalism, whatever they want to call it, right? They come with all kinds of names for it. Then at the same time, they'll say, oh, that's not real socialism. You're, you're, criticize, you're criticizing communism, not socialism. They'll say, oh, the Soviet Union was communist when it suits their own interests, so you can't say that was socialist. And so they, they play both sides of it. Uh, if you somewhere to tell you that the Soviet Union was maybe not real communism or it wasn't actually socialism, I mean, how do you view this? <laughs> well, my counter question would be, well, what is the real socialism or real communism then? I think the Soviet Union got pretty close to what, it, what it's supposed to be. 
Now, the game, obviously, that is being played here is whenever things turn, turn bad, the socialists say, well, that wasn't real socialism. I mean, of course, the good thing is you can go back into the archives and check how Bernie Sanders saying that bread lines in Soviet Union are good because that means, you know, rich people haven't bought all the bread. I mean, you have the same Bernie Sanders and people like that in 2007, 2008, I'm more like 2006, saying that Venezuela is a good example of a 21st century socialism, which of course was just propped up by high oil prices. And now, 13 years ago, we have the same people like Bernie Sanders saying, well, that wasn't really socialism. So you can't really argue with these people because whenever they have a fact, they dismiss it that it's not really socialism. I guess the counterpoint would be, well, show me a country that it really worked or show me the country that was socialist. And, it, and if no country was ever really socialist, so maybe socialism is just a theoretical construct. You cannot have your cake and eat it unless, I guess, it's Schrodinger's cake or, cake or quantum cake. Now, I know a lot of them talk about, well, the Nordic model, the Nordic model. What do you, what do you tell them? Well, Nordic model, Scandinavian countries, they're not socialist. In fact, it's, it's gotten so bad that in, uh, the prime minister in Denmark was giving a speech in the Harvard Business Club. And he said, guys, he said, or gentlemen, you know, let me make one thing clear. Denmark is not a socialist country. We're a capitalist, free market country. Yes, we have higher taxes for some things. Yes, we have a higher government sector, but we're not a socialist country. The point is that Bernie Sanders, once again, he's not listening. He knows better than the Danes what the Danes are. And if we really wanted to make poke fun of socialists, we could say, well, if you like Scandinavia so much, how about school choice? That's a thing all over Scandinavia. In fact, there was even school choice in Soviet Union. Nordic countries, Scandinavians, they're not socialists. Yes, some of the taxes are higher. Uh, the government sector is somewhat larger. But at the same time, they have things like school choice. In terms of competitiveness, they have very high competitiveness. Uh, many of them have, have very interesting sort of laws that enable them to be competitive. So once again, any way you cut it, from the Danes themselves, from any objective indicators, Denmark, Scandinavian countries, they're not socialist. Hmm. Now, why is it then, what, I'd say, what do you, what do you find, because I know you talk to a lot of kids who might believe in socialism, part of your organization is talking to younger, uh, younger generations. What, what are some of the biggest sticking points you feel you find when it comes to their understanding of socialism? What do, you, what do you find, typically? My finding is that they're confused. They care about equality, they care about environment, they care about justice, and they say socialism. To them, I say, all those things that you care about, equality, justice, environment, they are absolutely absent under socialism. Mm. Environment. I mean, you couldn't find any country that has had worse environmental performance than Soviet Union or the whole entire Soviet bloc, or even China for that, for that matter. I mean, the largest environmental disasters happen in socialist countries because they do not care about anything. Uh, you can, we, we can talk Chernobyl, the largest nuclear disaster in Soviet Union. You could talk RLC, the sort of the inland sea in, uh, in Asia, basically is gone because of how Soviets treated, treated the environment. So if you want environmental protection, you know, socialism is not the answer. Second point is you know, justice. Well, justice is a mockery in Soviet Union. You know, what is right and what is wrong, what is truth and what is lies are de defined by the party and the politi politicians, not by independent courts. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, independent court is an oxymoron under socialism. Equality? I don't know. Once again, I lived in social in, uh, in in Soviet Union under socialism. I didn't see no equality. Sure, there were many poor people, but in the same time, there were connected people. There were rich people. All of them were connected to to communist party. In fact, uh, it was so bad that communist party members had their own special shops, in which regular people were not even allowed. And the reason why they're not regular people were not allowed into these communist party member shops is because they would uh, those those special shops had like western goods or goods from yugoslavia or, or, or eastern germany that were sort of considered luxuries that regular people could not even buy so or uh, housing for instance so my family we grew i grew up in a basically what is a 30 square meters or 300 square feet of an apartment and that was considered good because it had its own bathroom and its own uh, kitchen Many families lived in what's essentially a dorms. We have to share a kitchen and a, uh, and a shower. And the thing, it wasn't a temporary thing like it is for students to live in a dorm. That was basically aspiration of your life to live there. So once again, there was no equality. So there were some people who had it really good. Once again, connected to the party. They had cars, they had drivers, they had, uh, they had dachers or basically uh, sort of retreats uh, in the woods or near the sea, sort, near the sea resort. Anyone else was basically living in poverty. 
I know a lot of people say, oh, well, we learn from that. We'll do it right next time. And it was actually even New York Times itself had an op-ed like this. It was on Karl Marx's, uh, I think, I want to say his birthday. Or it was someday marking Karl Marx. And they talked about in this op-ed from their editorial board how that, you know, one day we, they would perfect the system. And a lot of socialists <laughs> believe this, that they can perfect the system. What do you, what do you say to that? Well, how many failures, how many times do we need to fail until we say, you know, this doesn't, doesn't work? And I'm not talking about failure in a sense that uh, someone got upset or things went as good as it could be. I'm talking like real failures. We have Soviet Union. Okay, failure. Uh, China tries to emulate it. Failure. I'm talking like millions of people dying type of failure. Cambodia tries to emulate people, even a larger failure. Anytime it's been tried, it has been a failure. <laughs> even... I mean, we couldn't get into, we wouldn't want to get into economics lecture, but even the entire premise that it could be perfected is a failure. But I think anyone sane would look at this and say, how many more million people need to die until the politicians, until the elites of the New York Times, New York Times actually accept that it is a failure? 